Hi everyone, this lesson looks at exceptions to Mendel's laws. So, so far when looking at Mendelian genetics, we've said that a dominant allele is an allele that is always expressed when present. Looking at the cross here between two purple plants, you can see that any of the offspring that have a dominant allele, a big B in this case, is purple. We also learned that a recessive allele is expressed only in the absence of the dominant allele. So in this example, the white flower is white because there are no dominant alleles preventing that white recessive allele from being expressed. And these are the rules we assume for monohybrid and dihybrid crosses that we solved. But how do you explain this observation using those rules? Here you can see a red plant and a white plant cross produced all pink progeny, all pink offspring. So which one's dominant and which one's recessive? That model doesn't work here. Instances like this where you have a unique third phenotype is called incomplete dominance. This is when neither allele is completely dominant over the other. Instead, the heterozygote produces a blend of the two alleles. With this example of a red flower and a white flower, you can see the offspring is a blend of red and white, pink, and that that only occurs in the heterozygote. So why we can declare that neither one is completely dominant, it's incompletely dominant. Let's practice solving a Punnett square problem for incomplete dominance. In Japanese four o'clock plants, red color is incompletely dominant over white, or little r, flowers. And the heterozygous condition results in plants with pink flowers. For each of the following, construct the Punnett square and give the genotypic and phenotypic ratios of the offspring. So let's do a cross between a red plant and a white plant. There are two ways we can represent incomplete dominant squares. One way is to use the system you've learned before. I'm gonna have uppercase letters dictate what would normally be dominant. So in this case, I'm going to use uppercase R for red, and we can use a lowercase of the same letter, little r, to represent the white. Now it's not completely accurate because we don't have true dominance or recessive here. If you do a cross, you'll see that we have 100% big R, little r is our genotype, so 100% heterozygous, and our phenotypic ratio is 100% pink. A slightly more accurate way to represent this would be to give each color its own letter. So I'm still going to represent the red plant with R's, but I'm going to use W's to represent the white. So my red plant is big R, big R. My white plant is big W, big W. And when I do the cross, I have 100% big R, big W. So my genotypic is 100% RW. My phenotypic is 100% pink. When solving these problems, either of these rules are fine. You just want to remain consistent with how you solve your problems. So this is incomplete dominance. What if we observe something like this? Let's say a black bunny is crossed with a white bunny. One of the offspring is completely white, one's completely black, but two are Oreo. They are black and white. How do I explain this using Mendel traditional dominance or incomplete dominance? I can't. This is something called co-dominance. This is when both alleles are dominant and expressed at the same time. In this example, you can see I have a tannish cow and a brownish cow. All of their offspring are both tan and brown. They're both dominant at the same time. There's no better example of codominance than human blood types. You may have heard that humans can be type A, type B, type AB, or type O. Let's see the genetics behind that. If I am type A, that means on the outside surface of my red blood cells, I have an A antigen. Type B works the same way. You have type B antigens. For AB, you have both antigens, both expressed at the same time, co-dominant. And for type O, you have neither. Let's imagine that I do a blood transfusion and give blood from someone who's type A to someone who's type B. This is what I would see if I were to look into their blood. I find blood agglutination. The blood begins to clump together. Well, that's bad. I want to help this person out by giving them the blood that they need. Why is it clumping together? Well, this is happening because of an antibody and antigen reaction. Think back to the immune system. Antibodies attach and attack specific antigens. And these blood types have antigen markers. So it turns out that someone who's type A blood that has the A antigen in their body has antibodies that are anti-B that will attack any B blood that goes in. Type B has the opposite. They have the B antigen, so they have anti-A antibodies. This is what caused the clumping in the example we looked at. Type AB doesn't have any of these antibodies, and type O has antibodies for both. 
So when thinking about who we can donate blood to, it comes down to your type and the antibodies you have. Since type O has anti-A and anti-B antibodies, they can't receive type A or type B or type AB. They can only receive type O. However, let's look at AB. AB can receive A or B or O. B can receive O or other Bs, and A can receive O or other As. This is why oftentimes O is considered to be the universal donor, because all the blood types can receive O. Another type of blood typing that's found in humans is called the RH factor. This is named after the rhesus monkey, where it was discovered. With the rhesus factor, this is just another antigen in addition to AB or AB or O that can be present on human red blood cells. 85% of humans are RH positive, and it's important to know if you are or not if you're going to have children. If an RH positive man has a child with an RH negative woman, that baby's going to be RH positive, and that's going to create interactions between the mom's blood and the baby's blood that can be antagonistic. So that is something for a physician to be aware of during a pregnancy with conflicting blood types. So what determines your blood type? Genetics. You inherit your blood type from your parents. We can do a Punnett square for co-dominant traits like blood types. Let's say that uh, the woman is AB and the man is BO. If you're type B, you can be either big B, big B, homozygous for type B, or you can be heterozygous BO. You solve these crosses just like any other crosses. So this means there's a one in four chance they have a child that's AB, one in four chance of AO, one in four chance of BB, and one in four chance of BO. And it's these possibilities that we would use to solve these Punnett squares. Just so you're aware with the blood typing system, oftentimes we use the ABO letter annotation, but sometimes two I's can be used. As you can see in this table with the genotype, type A blood could be represented by little i a little i, or little i a little i a. The blank on top of the little i just means that, it just means O. Now let's look at cats. There's an interesting scenario when you're looking at the color of their fur. With males, a cat can be black or orange, and I'm just talking about the specific type. Yes, I know cats can be other colors as well. But with females, notice that a cat can be black or orange or black and orange, something we call calico. Now this is weird. Why would something be exclusive to the biological sex of an organism in terms of their genetics? How can we explain this? Well, it turns out that traits can be on the sex chromosomes of an organism instead of the other autosomal chromosomes. Females typically, not always, have XX as their sex chromosomes, and males typically have XY. Now, let's think that A is orange and B is black. These are the possible combinations of genotypes for the female. She could be homozygous for B and be black. She could be homozygous for A and be orange, or she could be heterozygous for both and express both at the same time. The thing is, traits like this are only carried on the X chromosome, and males only have one X. So for the male, they'll either have an X that's orange, being orange, or they'll have an X with a B, and they'll be black. There's no possibility for the male to be heterozygous. This is why oftentimes males are more susceptible to genetic diseases if they're sex-linked than their female counterparts. Females can be carriers, meaning they have one of each gene, Whereas males, you either have the gene or you don't. Colorblindness is the most common example of this. There are more males that are colorblind than females because of this very reason. So let's practice some Punnett squares with this. If I do a square just for the sex chromosomes, the egg's going to donate an X, and the sperm can donate either an X or a Y. That means every time there's fertilization, at least looking at human chromosomes, there's a 50% chance of having a girl and a 50% chance of having a boy. It's a coin flip each time. So what's determining the sex here? It's the sperm. The sperm's either going to carry an X or a Y, and that'll determine if it's a male-bodied or female-bodied person. The A can only donate an X. So let's try and solve a Punnett square problem. A black male is crossed with an orange female, and we're still talking about cats here. What are the sexes and color of their offspring? Well, let's set up my square. For the male, I know it's black, so I'm going to have X with a big B and a Y. The Y doesn't carry this gene. It is sex-linked and linked to the X. For the female, she's orange, so I'm going to do X big A, X big A. In this cross, 
I have the potential for a female that's calico, another female that's calico, a male that's orange, or a male that's orange. So I'm going to end up with two calico females and two orange males. And we can use the same methodology for any sex linked trait. You just put the trait as an exponent above the sex chromosomes and solve like you would a normal monohybrid RNA. Last thing I want us to look at is pedigrees. These are models or ways of representing how traits change over multiple generations. To read a pedigree, key, first thing to know is the shapes. Females are represented with circles and males are represented with squares. We begin with our parent generation and we work our way down to each allele. So with this one, I have the parent generation followed by the first allele, followed by the second allele, and each has its own weight. Now you'll notice that some are shaded and some are open. If a shell is shaded, that means it's affected, which means whatever traits being discussed, it has. If a cell is open, that means it's unaffected. It doesn't have the trait being discussed. And if you notice a slash through a square, that means that individual has deceased. So let's do a practice problem reading a pedigree. If person one has black hair and you're being told that's dominant, so that's my affected trait, and person two has blonde hair, what genotype must person one have to father kids three, four, and five? So you can see on the left hand of this pedigree, individuals one and two have three children. What are the what genotype must person one have for that to be their case? Well, this person's shaded, and I only have the dominant trait of black hair, so that means they have two potential genotypes. They can be big A, big A. I'm going to use A to represent dominant black hair in this case. Or they can be heterozygous with big A, little A. The female, though, she is recessive, so she's going to be little A, little A. So to figure out what his genotype is, I have to do two pundit crosses, one for homozygous dominant and one for heterozygous. So I just set those up, and let's see what happens. Solving for the first scenario where he's homozygous dominant, all of his children are going to have black hair. That's not what I see here. I have open squares with individuals, open squares and circles with individuals three and five. So that can't be what's happening. If he's heterozygous, however, there is the potential for him to have children that are affected and children that are unaffected like we see in the pedigree. So he must be heterozygous. I hope this was a helpful preview of how to solve some exceptions to Mendel's rules, and I'll see you next time.